Hi, I'm Whitney, and today I want to talk about how you can use your integrated pest management whiteboard, your IPM whiteboard, for some things other than mite counting. There's a lot of information that can be gained from it in addition to mite counts. And while I will talk a little bit about mite counting, I want to mostly talk about all the other kinds of information that you can get from looking at what all else falls out of the hive. It is a good, low-tech, non-invasive way of finding out something about what's going on in the hive. I consider it a form almost of remote sensing, except without any of the fancy electronics that usually go with that terminology. Lots of beekeepers, when they do their mite counts on their IPM whiteboard, they want to know what is all this junk, this other junk that's interfering with the mite counter, making it difficult. And I consider it potential information. Beekeepers often wonder about um, other things in addition to the mite burden. Things like, are there other pests in the hive? Um, is there a mouse in my hive? Are the bees getting enough protein diversity? Where's the cluster within the hive? Is, are the bees still alive even if it's the middle of the winter? Are they rearing brood? Are their cat brood emerging? Are they building comb? Where are they building comb? First, I'm going to talk about the equipment. It's basically, you need a quality whiteboard, and by that I mean something like a, a plastic board. You can use a stiff cardboard. You can use a piece of um, masonite painted white. You can use almost anything. Um, sometimes when I find old apartment sign, apartment for rent signs that are left on the side of the road or have fallen down, I'll collect them, cut it up, and you can turn it into a good whiteboard. I also find it helpful to have a magnifying glass and a flashlight or some strong light source. The sun is good if you're going to do it in the house having uh, a fairly bright flashlight is a good idea, um, especially if you're beginning to look at the things that are falling out of the beehive and uh, it's a lot easier to identify them with a magnifying glass and a flashlight. If you wear glasses, I recommend wearing them because they're looking at some very tiny things. You'll need as good a vision as you can get. And then a notebook or camera to take notes on what it is you're seeing. You might want to refer to them later or you might want to ask questions of somebody else using them. Um, also, it's good to have some time. Initially, it can take a while to look over a whiteboard and, and try and figure out what, what you're seeing. Um, and the other thing you need is curiosity. A good whiteboard should have a, and this is kind of a dirty one, but it should have a grid pattern. This one has two and a half inch grids, but in retrospect, I would now wish that I had put maybe closer to one and three quarters or two inch grid pattern. And the reason is that when I use my magnifying glass, it, um, the grid pattern doesn't show up entirely within the magnifying glass. I, I in retrospect, would have preferred to have the uh, one whole grid square show up within my magnifying glass. But you can suit yourself. Um, there are lots of different styles. Sometimes they come pre-printed. Here's an example of a pre-printed one. Sometimes they come pre-printed but only printed in the middle of the board that I prefer to have my grid pattern go all the way out to the edges of the board because stuff falls down almost all the way to the edge of the board. Um, I like to have a label on my board. This one is labeled A here in the corner of what would be if I slid it under a hive like this. It is in what would be the lower left front corner and it, it, I call it A because I have another one that's B and another one that's C. If I have three hives and I'm putting the boards under three hives, I, I take them all out, I can look at them and I can tell which one came from which hive. And if I have a, a marker that always tells me which is the left front corner or a specific position, then I always know um, how the board was oriented in the hive if I have, have put it in that way.
I like to have a sort of clean board. It doesn't have to be immaculately clean. This one's starting to get a little uh, gummed up. It's about actually probably going on seven years old of con constant use. Um, if you don't clean off any oil or grease substance you put on it right away, it starts basically turning into varnish, especially on a hot day, and gets harder and harder to clean off over time. Um, I could scour off the backside and add new grid marks. You can use another whiteboard as the straight line to make, make the um, grid marks. And I just use a regular um, Sharpie or magic marker to make the lines. Um, if you do put new lines on an old board, you need to really scrub it down real clean because any old bee gunk or um, oil will keep it from adhering all that well. Skinny lines are better than thick lines because it's hard to see things that line, land on the thick lines. I clean my boards um, depending on what, what kind of oil or grease I've put on them. I usually use Crisco. I apply a liberal amount of dish soap and use my bee gunk brush a retired scrub brush to scrub it down in hot water and a good amount of this uh, discoloration would come off. Another characteristic that's good is should be fairly flat. If it's a completely soft paper, then it won't, um, it won't, it won't, uh, well, it won't stay in position very easily. And also, if it's got a big bow in it, um, if, if it happens to rain and rain blows in, it'll collect in the low point. Um, if you have it perfectly flat, it's easy to slide it in, but one that is slightly bowed, as you may be able to see that this one is slightly bowed, um, it, can, it can be effective, but there's also some problems associated with that, that um, it can be hard to get it in or out. I'm going to just give a, a quick overview of some things to keep in mind if you're going to count mites, varroa mites, using a whiteboard. And this isn't a lecture about varroa mites. It's just a little side information about counting mites. That, first of all, it's a good idea to know what a mite looks like. If you haven't seen one or you're not familiar at looking at them, find somebody who is. I like to suggest that people Find somebody who has some mites in their hive and ask to have a board or, or go visit them after they've put a whiteboard under their hive. Take a piece of packing tape, clear packing tape, and just dab it down on the sticky side against the stuff that fell out of the hive and you'll end up with some of that adhering to the sticky packing tape which you can then fold over in half so that it's sealed on both sides. The stuff that was on the whiteboard is now stuck in between the two pieces of tape. And this piece here has two or three mites on it. It was from a hive with fairly heavy mite burden. Then you, once you know what a mite looks like, you want to look at the whole board. It's a good idea to, when you count for mites, count the whole board. You count, count along one row. Um, and have a, have a consistent policy, for example, that you'll always count only mites that are on the left-hand side of a uh, grid box or on the top of the grid box. That way, even though you might see that there's a mite that's on this line when you're counting along this row, you won't count it because you will count it when you come to this row um, where it will be at the top of the grid box. And that way you only count each mite once instead of double counting ones that are on the lines. So I use the left-hand side and the top side of each box. If there's a mite on it, then I count it. If it's on the bottom, for example, or for this one for the bottom or the right-hand side, then I don't count it. That information is cons fairly consistent with how, um, for example, in biology or microbiology, cells and um, bacteria are counted. So it's not something I'm making up. It's a, a standard policy to have a, 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 a consistent practice to make sure that you don't double count. Don't agonize over the mite count. I mean, you can spend hours doing it if you're trying to figure out every single little speck. Um, it's, it's good enough to get, uh, um, to get the, um, 
a general idea. You know, what, being off by one or two mites isn't going to make a huge difference. Mites are usually um, dark brown. They tend sometimes to be a slightly reddish. They can sometimes appear sort of black. Um, but when they are very newly emerged from the bee's pupil cell, they can be quite pale, sort of a sandy color. You want to count those as well. Another thing that sometimes looks like a mite but isn't necessarily is the um, carapace from the, that the most immature um, level of mite that you would find out on the whiteboard has shed. That will not have any legs. If you flip it over, there's no sign of any mite body or anything. It's just, it's just the outer back shell. Um, I think most people probably don't count those, although I think it's an indication that the mites are multiplying fairly rapidly if you see a lot of those, so you might want to take that into consideration. You count both the larger females and the smaller male mites. You'll see a couple sizes, and they're all small, but there are different sizes. One thing about counting mites or looking at the whiteboard at all in general is if you are not able to get it under your hive and remove it without scraping off any grease that you might put on it to catch the mites or without scraping off the, all the mites themselves, then you are losing useful information. This board is a little bit warped. It's a little bit bowed. So when I slide it under, the crown of it tends to get scraped. But if I, uh, if I carefully push my finger at the high point and press down, I can just slide it under gradually without it getting scraped. Um, if you want to test your technique, one thing I found helpful for me was to use some Crisco, smear the board with a paper towel and maybe uh, one to two tablespoons of Crisco, and then I sprinkled black pepper on it, simulated mites, and then made sure that I was able to slide it under the hive without disturbing the pepper. There's a couple of ways the whiteboards can be applied underneath hives. Really all you need is two layers of space underneath the bottom screen and, and one of them will support your board. In this case, this is a Brushy Mountain style. They have made that second space supported just by some string that's um, applied with a staple gun underneath the the ridges that hold the bottom board up. So this just slides in under the string. That's a very simple solution. Um, there's another bottom board example here with, with um, some plastic angle. I think it uh, looks similar to the trim that's put on the edge of plaster corners and it's just held in place by staple, staple gun staples once again and the whiteboard slides down um, in between those. But one could also just build a, uh, a second level using a couple of boards um, and some kind of a rack underneath. You don't want to have too much space between the bottom of the hive and the board because um, sometimes the bees will go take a look at what's down there. They might get stuck um, or you want to have enough space that they can get out freely. As with anything with the whiteboard, it's a good idea to have plenty of bright light. Um, wear your glasses, use a magnifying glass. And I find it handy to also keep a toothpick available so that I can poke at whatever it is I'm looking at, turn it over, um, see if it has legs, see if it smashes. If you can smear it easily, it's not a mite. If it flips over and it has tiny little legs on the bottom sort of folded up, it is a mite. So take your time, be patient, and look at what you have. I do find that the early spring packages coming from out of state, they've definitely been treated for mites so that they tend not to have mites in the spring and going into the early summer. Not, not many mites fall out on a whiteboard, so 
uh, beginning mic counting would be kind of frustrating if you're using your own boards during those periods because you really might not find many. However, the numbers in my experience tend to pick up quite a bit towards the late summer and into the fall. So don't assume that just because you don't have uh, mites on your whiteboard in the early spring or mid spring and early summer that you're never going to have them. They can be uh, can become quite a problem in the fall and as those temperatures get cooler the options for um, doing something about them are reduced. You can no longer, it's too late to requeen, it, um, it's too late to use some of the uh, less harsh chemical treatments. Um, so you know, keep, in, keep that in mind and have a plan. Another thing you might find on a whiteboard when you're looking for mites is a bee louse. It is about the same size as a mite, but it has a little bit different shape. Um, I don't see a lot of them, but I have seen them. And I have the, um, this, this uh, photo, is a nice photo from the website of a guy in Sweden and also the Mid-Atlantic Apiculture Research and Extension Consortium um, provides some information about the bee louse. They're supposedly harmless, but then you see a picture of a, of a bee just covered with them and you think, doesn't look that great anyway either. <laughs> now I wanna talk about the other things that I like to do with the mite board. This is a topic I've gotten kind of interested in. I find it helpful to think about the cluster within the hive as a three-dimensional space and that the whiteboard is a reflected plan of what's going on in that three-dimensional space below. It's a, a two-dimensional reflection of what's going on in the space above. Because the bees um, normal life activities cause them to drop debris down through the frames. The, there are, you end up with white stripes on the whiteboard that are the spaces where the frames were and the debris show up as um, materials in striped rows in between where the frames are. I have a, a very crude representation here. You see in the upper left corner, it is uh, the white a board front left represented by the red dot. This is uh, whiteboard A and also marked in the upper left corner of the slide. And it's a summer, so the cluster is large. There really isn't much of a cluster. The bees are everywhere. In the winter, the cluster will shrink. So the bees are keeping themselves warmer. They cluster more tightly and they may not fill the whole hive at all. They'll be just in one area as in this slide for the winter. So I pose the question, if you have a winter cluster, it's small, and these bees are uncapping honey from the last two frames on the left-hand side of the hive, what are you going to see on the whiteboard below? When the bees are uncapping honey that they're going to consume, the little uh, wax that they remove tends to be um, little squiggly, pale brown squiggly bits of wax, and you would see it in a pattern that is um, the stripes in between the frames surrounding the those last two frames. And what do we know from seeing that kind of information? Well, that, you, that for one thing, the bees are alive in there. It might be middle of winter. Um, you don't necessarily see bees coming in and out of the hive, but you can tell that they're alive because they're producing little squiggles of uh, wax where they're uncapping honey. You know that they're in there and they're eating. Um, you also know how, over how wide an area they are uncapping honey. And you can tell if it's a fairly wide area, then there's probably quite a few bees in there. Um, however, if they are eating honey that has already been uncapped or was never capped, there won't be any un uncappings, no little wax squiggles on the bottom. So it, um, it isn't a perfect test. You can also tell from where the uh, debris falls where the cluster is in the colony, in the, in the hive. For example, that example I showed, they were in the rear left corner. And if you happen to have checked um, in a box that's 
above them and knew that there was plenty of honey in the left corner in the box above them, then you know that they, they could move up into plenty of food. But if those frames are already empty in the, frame, in the box above them, you might want to rearrange the honey so that they could get to it more easily if you think that they're, they're not going to move around the hive themselves. You can also tell if all you find on the whiteboard in the middle of winter is the little squiggles of uncapped honey that no brood is emerging. When brood emerges, the young emerging bee tends to chew around the edge of a cap and you, and you will see little that signal that brood is emerging. You can also tell from looking at the board that's been under the hive in the middle of winter, whether there's a mouse in residence. Um, if there is no sign of mouse poop, no uh, just total mayhem torn up comb, then there probably isn't a mouse. So that can be reassuring if it's something that you worry about. When the bees aren't very active or if there are not that many bees, you might need to leave the whiteboard under the hive for several days to get enough information to really make it clear what's going on. But keep in mind that what you're looking at is the uh, snapshot of the average of what happened over the time period for which the whiteboard was under the hive. So if it's cold in the winter and you've left the whiteboard mostly uh, in place in um, January or early February because the bees are beginning to raise brood and you live in a cold climate and you're giving them a little added protection. Um, remember that when you pull it out and look at it, there might be a lot of, of debris down there, but you don't know exactly when they were um, obtained. It could be that they were was stuff that fell down in early January and you're looking at it in late January and that the bees have all died now because uh, even though it looks like there's stuff on the board, it was there uh, for a long time. So the most useful is if you can put it in for a day or two or maybe three or four. Um, and that means that this method is more helpful for people who have hives that they can get to fairly easily in the backyard or nearby in the community rather than uh, 100 miles away where you can't go and check them very often. Now I'm going to talk about all the other things that you might find on the board in addition to the things we've talked about. I have a slide here that shows an example of a lot of different things that were going on. It was under the hive for a little, a little bit of time, a few days, and I, I think it was in a early spring time frame. So there was a lot going on, including a fair number of mites. It was a hive that had had uh, very little treatment in the previous fall and that the mites were beginning to ramp back up even though it was spring. So on this slide, I've marked with different uh, indicators. You can see frass, which is the um, official term for bug poop, for other kinds of bugs, insects that might be hanging out in the hive, like earwigs, um, small hive beetles, other types of um, bugs that produce uh, poop that looks a bit like a little barrel when you look at it with the magnifying glass. It's, they tend to be elongated, um, fairly cylindrical, sometimes with, with ridges. Ants are another thing that you will often see on the whiteboard, that ants are uh, very common around beehives. Bees drop stuff. The ants like all that stuff, there's um, good nutrition for, bee, for ants in the things that bees drop. And so when you put a whiteboard under the hive, it prevents those things from falling on the ground. So the ants just go up and, and go, get it off the whiteboard. They're accustomed to having it. So it's not uncommon to find ants. You can sometimes have the ants become a problem, not so much to the bees in the colony, they're able to defend themselves against the ants, but they can interfere with your, your evaluation of your whiteboard. They, I've seen them totally clear off um, a section of the um, grease that's applied to the whiteboard to help things stick to it. They've just carried away the Crisco along with everything else. They've, um, um, I've seen them sling a, uh, 
a live mite over their shoulder and carry it home, hanging out like a backpack over their shoulder, and the mite's there wiggling all his legs. Um, I've seen them clear off every mite off of a board. They also like the pollen, um, any fallen sugar from fondant. Of course, as if you're feeding the bees sugar syrup and some spills, the ants love that. Um, so they can really affect the, what you see. The, the tiny, tiny sugar ants are less likely to interfere with a mite count than the larger, more long-legged ants that are big enough to carry a mite home as a prize and they can also more easily wade through whatever it is you put on the whiteboard. I should backtrack just briefly and say that if you are um, going to capture anything on your whiteboard, um, it's a, a good practice to put a thin layer of oil or grease of some type on it to help um, things stick to the board, they don't blow off as easily, and also um, if it's a, a bit greasy, it's more difficult for the mites to crawl away. They're pretty much stuck there and they can eventually be killed. It also inhibits the ants somewhat. Um, I put on, uh, I use Crisco because I feel like I can wash it off in the sink. I put on a layer that's thick enough so I can see thin streaks in it. You don't want it to so thin a film that you can't see any streaks, but you don't need any globs. Also, I've, I know people who use Vaseline as an alternative, spray Pam cooking spray, um, or even a little bit of vegetable oil, although that doesn't leave as um, thick a film. You, probably a good idea to avoid the butter flavored um, types of, of sprays and oils because that just attracts the ants even more. Um, when it's time to clean those things off, you can take a, I take a piece of junk mail, I mean, what else is it good for? And squeegee it off and then drop it in the trash. And then there's just the very fine, thin film um, left. I put a generous amount of dish soap on, use my gunk, my bee gunk, my bee gunk uh, brush and scrub it down well. So now back to the um, example whiteboard that has a lot of things on it. There's a, a section that shows what the squiggly uncapped honey looks like. There is a wax moth evident and some discarded fondant. I was worried about my bees. I was going out of town and I had put a little fondant in there. The bees had not been interested in it at all, actually. We were having the first beginnings of a nectar flow. There were a couple of warm days warm enough that the bees were able to go and get some early nectar. They did not want fondant at all and I found it all cluttered on the bottom of the whiteboard. They also found a little bit of pollen and there's some examples of that. There's a few mites that show and that there are some examples of cappings off of uh, the cells of bees that were emerging, which means that they were actively, bees brood was actually actively emerging during that period of time. Um, there were also bee parts. That's a very common thing to find on the whiteboard. Um, dead bees get disassembled and then you find parts of them dead, damaged, or unwell larvae, especially in the winter, chilled brood, uh, get disassembled and you find them, little bits of them on the bottom of the whiteboard too. Let's see, I already talked about the frass a little bit, frass being bug, insect pooped, not the bees poop, but um, other residents that hang out around the hive. I said it was barrel shaped. It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere, always in the hive. It doesn't mean anything bad. Many of these, um, in, many of these types of bugs are just, they are uh, freeloading without necessarily causing a lot of uh, harm. So you don't necessarily need to worry about it if you don't see that you have a big, um, like for example, if you have a, an infestation of small hive beetles, you need to address it as a small hive beetle problem, but just seeing a little bit of frass on your whiteboard or even a fair amount of it without strong evidence of an infestation of some other bug, then you don't really need to worry about it.
Also, sometimes on the whiteboard you can see the larva of a small hive beetle. The larvae have been feeding in the hive and they are ready to leave the hive and go down uh, to the ground to pupate. They will be blocked by the whiteboard and you might find them on the board. So a mature small hive beetle larva on the board is a bad sign. If you find really tiny, tiny, like quarter inch long, small hive beetle larva, that means the bees are winning, that the, the, the beetles might have um, had a chance to lay eggs and some of those hatched and made larva, but that the bees are getting those larva under control, that they are catching them and removing from the hive, a few of them are falling out. You might find also small um, wax moth larva, sometimes you can find the cobweb of a wax moth larva that's been trying to exist in the pollen down below the hive. Hopefully the ants will get it. You might find the whole small hive beetles too. Usually you will see them in the hive as well as dead on the bottom board. Um, so it shouldn't be a surprise if you find that you have them in your hive, if you found one on your bottom board. It's not uncommon to see one there. You also find visitors, spiders, earwigs, things like that. The wax moths in a colony that isn't strong enough to protect itself from them, um, the, the wax moth larva begins crawling through and consuming comb in the brood area, particularly comb that has pollen in it or that had um, the bees had pupated in. And the bees will, in an attempt to rid themselves of that larva, will begin tearing apart the comb. It looks like um, basically shred up broken honeycomb. Um, and often with a lot of cobwebs, you'll find that on the whiteboard. So it can be a kind of early warning indicator. If you see a lot of crumbled up broken comb on the whiteboard, it means that the bees are, for one reason or another, really tearing, tearing up their property and that you might want to go in and see if they need some help with some pests in there. Mouse can do a lot of damage. Uh, I was very fortunate in preparing for this slideshow to have set some comb aside to be um, melted when the weather got warm enough and a mouse moved in. So I, I have photos of the damage the mouse did and some examples of the debris that they left behind. You would see badly shredded comb, but usually not with, that, with much in the way of pollen left because the bees like to eat, I mean the mice like to eat the pollen. Um, you see mouse droppings, seeds that the mouse has brought home, partly gnawed, you know, something that has a lot of uh, partly gnawed nuts and seeds and hulls. I had some, found some rose hips in this hive that a mouse had gotten into. Um, the rose hips were partly eaten. Um, so it, a plant material that's a lot more than you would expect to have been blown in just by the wind. When bees get diarrhea, you sometimes see that on the whiteboard, although it's very unusual for them to not leave the hive to go. They usually um, don't, don't soil their, their own hive, so you don't typically find it inside the hive unless maybe you only push the whiteboard in halfway and there's a little bit of board sticking out front, then you might find it splat. Um, it can, of course, um, signal that the bees are sick with some, some gut infection like Nosema, but it also can mean something as simple as that the nectar flow began and they gleefully got into some very wet nectar and, and fed heavily and now um, it's basically a lot of excess liquid is coming out. I like to look at the pollen that falls out of, uh, out of the hive. The bees bring home pollen um, uh, attached to their rear legs and that sometimes in transferring that pollen into cells it's dropped and you find the little packets of pollen on the bottom board. You can line them up and see the range of colors, the um, different types of um, pollen sources that bees have available to them and the more colors that you are able to see the greater the nutritional diversity that the bees are getting right at that time and that's kind of interesting.
You can also see signs that bees are drawing comb. They extrude wax through between the, the plates in the abdomen and I have some examples of the little wax flakes that the bees extrude. They look like, to, to me, they look like tiny shards of clear glass, um, maybe a millimeter in size, very small, um, shiny and clear, and it's always a good sign that they're building comb. And you can tell what part of the hive they're probably building it in because it'll, the any little wax flakes that they've lost track of and uh, dropped will fall down from that area where they're building comb. You may also find things like newspaper fluff, particularly if you combined a uh, t combined two colonies with a sheet or two of newspaper in between them. The bees tear out the newspaper, turn it into very fine shredded fluff. It's a, so usually a sort of grayish, greenish color. You also might find flakes of shredded up wax paper, particularly if wax paper was the backing on something like a fondant or a pollen patty or grease patty that you put in your colony. The bees will tear that out and it, it's uh, small white shards of wax paper. As I had mentioned before, you can see signs that the bees are rearing brood. You can find the, the cappings from the brood. It looks like a little toast brown hatch door that got knocked off of the cell. You can tell whether a lot of brood is emerging or just a little bit. Um, and you can tell uh, how over what area. Is it uh, the whole length of a frame? Is it just a tiny patch in one area? So it can give you an idea of how, how rapidly the population is increasing. Also, you can see signs of bee loss. Are there a large number of disassembled bee parts, lots of heads down on the bottom, or lots and lots and lots of wings, suggesting that maybe there's been a larger die-off and that they're decomposing near the bottom and that their population isn't great enough to carry them all outside. You can look for also tiny dead larvae, particularly after a cold spell. There might have been some chilled brood that died. It eventually kind of desiccates and begins to rot. The bees pull it out and start discarding it. And if they drop some, you'll find them um, on the whiteboard as well. Discarded fondant and sugar crystals is pretty common that the bees would rather have nectar if they can get it. And so they, I find that my bees typically start tearing out the fondant and just discarding it. I find it on the whiteboard as soon as there is um, something that they prefer available, like good nectar. Um, also pollen patties. Um, if there is plenty of pollen available, bees tend to prefer the real thing. So if they have, have access to the real thing, then they consider the pollen patty uh, something just that they, is in the way and they need to get rid of it and they'll begin tearing it up and you'll find some of it on the bottom of the whiteboard. You might also find little blobs of propolis that they're um, in hot weather. They're, they can be a little bit sticky or gummy on the um, if you poke them with a toothpick. You can also see anything at all, whatever it is that the bees bring home, whatever gets blown into the hive. It can be stuff that gets got stuck to the bottom of a box when you set it down on something else and you didn't realize when you brought the box back and put it on top of um, the, a stack of boxes that you had something stuck to the bottom. The bees are going to disassemble that and you'll may find residual of it on the whiteboard below. So the whiteboard can answer many questions, but it can also raise a lot of questions. Sometimes, sometimes there's mysterious things. You don't know what it is. You can't tell. You have to think of the recent history and use common sense. See if you can, see if you can figure out what it is if you are curious. Um, I got a question recently from somebody who said he just checked his IPM board and found this some kind of weird fibery fluff underneath and he, he couldn't, couldn't imagine what it was. He wanted to know if I knew and um, I didn't really know the history of the hive. But I said it looked kind of, to me, it looked a little bit like very fine wood shavings. And he said, 
oh, geez, that's right. He, it turns out he had very recently used some balsa wood as part of a comb guide in his hive. And two days later, he was finding it all over the bottom. And in fact, he said that he could hear um, a vigorous, uh, vigorous bee action as they tried to sort of gnaw away at the balsa wood so that they could get it out. That's the end of my talk. Anything that falls out of the hive got in there somehow. It either was carried in by the bees, it blew in, or it was raised in there. And additionally, anything that goes into the hive is eventually going to fall out. So if you're curious about what's in the hive, it's up to you to think back about the history, consider what was going on in the hive and what might have caused what it is you're seeing.